Good afternoon and welcome to my living room. Thanks for joining me here today. As Carlos mentioned, I'm a landscape technologist working on projects in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. In my role, I create plans and 3D renderings that are used to build outdoor spaces like this community garden at the U of A South Campus. And then I get to watch as these spaces grow and change with the people that use them. In my eight years working with IBI Group, I've been lucky to be involved with a number of heritage projects like these ones at Grispa, Lighthorse Park, and Blatchford. And I've had the serious pleasure of working with goofballs like this. So a quick intro to biomimicry. Bio in Latin means life. And mimicus means to imitate. So together, biomimicry means to imitate life. Or to put it another way, design inspired by nature. This is an approach that can be used by any discipline from manufacturing to art to agriculture. If you care to share, add your passion or job description to the chat, it would be cool to see what kinds of folks we have here today. Biomimicry is a powerful idea and I hope to show you why during this presentation. So what kinds of things can we learn from nature? Does anyone know what this is? If you have a guess, put it in the chat. Here's a hint. It's a pretty common example found in biomimicry, largely because it's been a successful product for 80 years. That's right, it's a picture of Velcro as seen through a scanning electron microscope. I'll talk more about those later. The inventor of Velcro noticed how the burrs of the thistle plant stuck to his dog's fur and realized that this could be used to create a new type of fastener. Notice the similarity between the hooks on the thistle and the hooks of the Velcro. In one sense, Velcro's design does a good job simply by replicating the hooked end of the burr an easy to use and reusable fastener was created. But it could be better. Velcro is still made of plastics that create toxic byproducts that are harmful to the environment. Because of this, Velcro is, I think, a shallow example of biomimicry. It is a product whose design was inspired by nature, but it could still be better. There are some general rules that are followed by most living things, something that biomimicry practitioners like to call life's principles. And the thread tying these rules together is the idea that life creates conditions for life. The death of a tree creates the conditions for these mushrooms to grow and the lives of these mushrooms and the mycelial network of them supports the life of more trees. This is the idea of circularity, a theme found throughout nature. Like compound interests that can generate big payoffs over time, these systems feed back into each other, compounding resources and energy. And so it is with man-made systems as well. If we take care of the earth and help life to flourish, that care will be returned to us in productive land, fresh air, a diversity of food, and healthy places for people. If we harm the living systems that support us, the earth will become harmful to us as well. So how can human activity support life on Earth rather than harming it? To find the answer, biomimicry practitioners like to reframe the question. We might ask instead, how does nature support the living systems of the Earth? And then we look for examples. Let's look at manufacturing, for instance. The old linear model focuses on short-term consumption but I'm sure that we can all agree that we don't want any more landfills. The circular economy is a biomimicry concept that focuses on these three ideas. Designs that minimize or eliminate waste and pollution, keeping products and materials in use for as long as possible, and regenerating natural systems. That kind of sounds like the tree and the mushroom, right? Reduce, reuse, and recycle are built into this circular economy approach with the important added element of good design that facilitates all of these steps. So how can our waste be used to build capital? This is a pretty straightforward thing for objects like paper where we can recycle or compost the materials. 
Improving our recycling systems will ensure that we can squeeze even more out of these resources. But what about phones, appliances, and other technical products? These goods have valuable parts and materials in them that we would ideally use over and over again. The analogy to natural systems here is how ecosystems cycle minerals and nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus. Nutrients are not destroyed when they are used. They are temporarily captured in living systems, returned to the environment when the organism dies. These components are then broken down and used again. Here is a diagram of the energy and material flows in a circular economy model. Notice the cyclical nature of the process and how it is similar to the nitrogen cycle on the previous slide. At the top, we see the initial inputs, which should ultimately get caught up in the loops and stay within the system. This approach makes technical products valuable at the end of their lives as well, changing them from a liability into an asset. In many cases, it is cheaper to harvest the old product and reuse its parts rather than to harvest and process raw materials. And if these products are designed for disassembly, the costs are further reduced. Like natural systems, can we eliminate waste and pollution, keep resources in use as long as possible and regenerate natural systems as an inherent part of our activity? These are the kinds of questions that biomimicry can help to answer. Let's look at something else. Traffic jams are a pervasive problem in cities and result in pollution and a serious waste of time. I couldn't find an Alberta statistic, but one study found that Toronto drivers lose as many as 84 hours a year being stuck in traffic on top of their regular commute. This is not only wasted time, but also results in more stress for drivers and pedestrians and higher emissions. A good source of inspiration might actually come from these guys. Ants move an incredible amount of material around, but are never stuck in traffic. When only a few dudes are crawling around, they space themselves out and act individually. The same thing that we do when roads are quiet. The difference appears when it is crowded. Ants become more like a single entity that just keeps flowing. So why do people get stuck in traffic? This happens because we are each thinking of our own needs and do not address our driving for the good of the whole. If an ant gets stuck behind a slow poke, they fall in line and match speeds. People on the other hand will honk horns, switch lanes and make impulsive changes, which creates confusion and can bring everything to a screeching halt. Droids and self-driving cars of the future may be able to follow simple rules like the ants do, bypassing our individual egos. For those of you new to the topic of biomimicry, I've created a resource page with some good places to start if you want to learn more. There are lots of well-known biomimicry success stories that are covered by other presentations and TED Talks, some of which are included in that document. I will just hint at these very briefly before I get into the good stuff today. In the 1970s, forest floors inspired the carpet tile, a move away from large rolls of carpet used in the past. Now modular pieces significantly reduce the wasted cut, cuts from the rolls and make it easy to replace carpet in small areas. The bumpy structure on the leading edge of the whale fin has been added to the design of wind turbines, improving the efficiency over conventional turbines by as much as 20%. And structural color, which is the creation of color using tiny structures that interact with light, is inspiring new materials that shine like butterfly wings without the use of toxic pigments. Each of these has a sustainability win and these are only a few of the many biomimicry success stories that you can find more about online. Now that you have a few examples, I'd like to introduce the topic of life-friendly chemistry. I believe that understanding this even at a basic level could have a paradigm shifting impact on the sustainability of human systems. The idea here is that chemicals and chemical combinations used in nature are life-friendly. Now I'm not a chemist, but I find this to be a good illustration of one of the key differences between natural and man-made products. Here is the periodic table of elements, highlighting those elements used in natural systems. 
Notice that mostly the simplest of elements are the ones that are used the most, shown in the red dots, dark orange. Hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. And then here we see the elements used by human industry and commerce. I'll show you that again. So the 30 or so elements used by nature and natural systems, and about double that or 60 in humanity's toolkit. And to give you a quick product example, here are the elements used to build a cell phone. As a reminder, all of the gray dots are not used in living systems at all. Some of these are pretty rare or toxic, and it would be better to find a way to replace them. Despite this smaller tool palette, living things create better materials than we can. Most of nature's materials are combinations of simple elements, and yet living organisms create everything from the brilliant wings of the butterfly to the flexible tube feet of the starfish seen here. And to top that, they are biodegradable, a feat we have yet to master. There is another way in which man-made and natural materials differ. Industry achieves functions by gluing together layers of different materials like paper, plastic, and foil, each of these layers serving a different function. The paper might provide structure with a plastic layer to provide waterproofing on the inside. Individually, these components can be recycled, but once they are bonded together, they become difficult to separate and often end up in landfills. Believe it or not, crab shells serve many of the same functions as that cup. They both need to be rigid, protect from impact, and manage moisture. In addition, when the crab dies, it biodegrades, releasing its components back into the soil, also a desirable property for our single-use products. Rather than using layered and glued materials, nature uses a complex structure to achieve many functions at once. And biomimicry asks if, if we can figure out how the crab creates this structure so that we may replicate the solution. Chitin is the structural building material of arthropods like this crab. It is made of fibers that are bundled together, as you can see on the bottom right. And with each layer of the shell, which is sort of the zoom out uh, closer to the top, these bundles of fibers are rotated slightly from the layer below. This hierarchical structure of fibers is what creates the desirable properties of the crab shell. As the thickness, diameter, and orientation of the fibers change, this changes the properties, some combinations providing rigidity, others providing waterproofing or something else. And here are some of the common structures found in biology. Learning about these structures can help us make better materials with a wider range of products, uh, with a wider range of properties. The fibrous and helical structures of the crab shell are included here and are patterns that can be seen in the structure of many other living things. Okay, my first test was too easy. Does anyone know what this is? A few good guesses here. Would you believe that that's a fruit fly egg? Also a tongue twister. The image was taken by a scanning electron microscope that sees things at a very tiny scale. Electron microscopes detect structure, not color, which is why these images are typically seen in black and white. Working with artists can add another layer of information to these scientific diagrams using color to enhance different parts of the scan. Here we see the same image rendered by the scientist and artist Tina Carvalho, who shares her work under the name Microangela. I've used a few of her scanning electron microscope images throughout this presentation. Other tools like X-ray allow us to see through objects to understand more about their density and composition. And again, adding color can create, turn the science into easily understandable diagrams. Today, we even have the tools that help us see from outer space or near orbit. The bright blue shown here is a phytoplankton bloom, a whole lot of algae found near the coast of Newfoundland that lasted more than three weeks last summer. We are at a unique point in time where we have the tools to see from the nano to the macro, 
And these tools are helping us learn about the strategies found in nature. At the same time, 3D printing and other additive manufacturing processes are giving us new ways to emulate the structures and materials of the living world and to engage with all kinds of people. If you're not familiar with 3D printing, it is a process that allows us to build up objects one layer at a time using materials such as plastic, ceramics, glass, or metal. One of the benefits of additive manufacturing is that it can seriously cut down on waste. In the case of the lattice we see here, if we use traditional manufacturing processes, as much as 50% of the material would be lost just cutting out the holes. Remember this guy? Biomimicry and 3D printing are a really good fit for each other. Biologists and other scientists are learning how nature achieves these superior materials and 3D printing allows us to replicate them. Cement is a brittle material, but researchers have been able to make it stronger by studying arthropod shells like the crab. They didn't change the chemistry to achieve this feat, they changed the structure. Like the crab shell, here they are printing long fibers rotated slightly with each layer. Cracks that form in the material follow this twisted pattern and break sacrificial links without weakening the rest of the structure. This turns concrete's weakness, how brittle it is, into a strength. Right now, the researchers are only emulating the orientation changes of the fiber. Can we also learn about the bundled nature of those fibers and replicate this in our 3D printing technology? Maybe a new print head or type of filament would make this possible. Of course, we could look at how the crab shell does it, but one of the superpowers of biomimicry is the ability to combine strategies from different organisms. Here we see the spinnerets of a spider producing silk. It kind of looks like the head of a 3D printer extruding material. Within each spinneret are a number of spigots, which you can see on the right, that release a liquid that solidifies and combines to create the silk. The spigots and the spinneret can move in different ways, changing the structure of the material produced. And changing the structure changes the properties. Using a single print head, as it were, spiders produce many types of silk with a wide range of properties. One type of silk is coated with a cement-like glue that allows them to attach it to other structures. Another type is used for the frame and supports, providing strength and elasticity. And another type of silk is used for the sticky part that captures prey. The stickiness is due, due to droplets of spider glue that are placed on the spiral structure. In addition to this, spiders have other types of silk that allow them to fly on the wind, wrap up their prey and protect their eggs. All of this is made using biodegradable materials composed mostly of large proteins. The spinnerets of the spider could provide inspiration for new 3D printing heads. Maybe one day we will have printers that work at room temperature in much the same way as the spider's spinnerets, using simple elements to create materials tougher than steel. Zooming back out, we can see that life uses local materials to create the things it needs. The bird's nest, for instance, is created of grasses, branches, and mud, all found nearby. And when the birds leave the nest, the structure can decompose, returning captured nutrients back to the earth. Do we really need to import products from the other side of the planet? Or could we take advantage of our abundant waste materials to produce all of the things that we need? With 3D printers, a single machine can produce a wide range of objects and tools. It seems to me that finding new materials to use would be a big sustainability win. Materium is an open source library of recipes for making new materials from biomass with the aim of supporting regenerative circular economies like those that I talked about at the beginning. Here are two recipes that use biomass for 3D printing. As our knowledge of these materials grows, different regions could have their own niches. Landlocked cities like Edmonton might focus on using our agricultural wastes or abundant clay to create new kinds of materials whereas coastal cities might take advantage of waste from the seafood industry. And like nature, can we find simple ways to break these materials down so that we can use them over and over and over again? I hope that I've convinced you that the answer to this question is yes. So what do you do if you want to learn more? 
Well, you can connect with us to start. Biomimicry Alberta is the local group here and includes scientists, biologists, and practitioners who are interested in learning from nature. You can sign up for our newsletter on our website, or you can connect to us through Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn under the name Biomimicry Alberta or Biomimicry AB to hear about upcoming events. There's also Zygote Quarterly, a publication out of Calgary that was started by one of our local superstars, Marianne Egermont. This magazine is available free online and showcases biomimicry research and innovation and has received international recognition. If you want to connect with us or check out some cool biomimicry resources or example, or if you missed most of this presentation because you're still logging in, you can uh, download this PDF that I prepped for you guys to use as a future reference, which includes links to a number of resources. My email address is included in the document. Feel free to reach out if you are interested in connecting. I know that things are weird right now, but public parts, parks are open and some zoos and greenhouses are letting in small numbers of people. Failing that, anyone can attend virtual tours which are being offered from venues around the world. Nature documentaries are also great and can allow you to explore alien landscapes from the comfort of home. And there are lots of online presentations and TED Talks that explore the topic in detail. You might take notes or sketch out what you see, ask yourself what makes these creatures well suited to their environment and which adaptations help them survive and thrive. If you work in an engineering or design field, look for organisms that are solving the problems you want to solve and see what you can learn from them. And if you own a company or invest in research and products, look for change makers who know how to recognize and uncover nature inspired solutions. Sponsor events like these ones or hire biomimicry professionals who can work with your design team to improve your products and services. Above all, we need to protect the organisms that provide this knowledge. Without them, our lives are less and their adaptive strategies may be lost to us forever. Life creates conditions for life and people can too. Finally, I know it's cold outside for lots of us right now, but get out there anyways. There are lots of adaptive strategies that can be learned even in the darkest and coldest months. This period of isolation resulting from COVID-19 is an opportunity to reimagine economies around the world. And with this reset, we can bring in new understandings and ideas, aligning human activity with the living networks that support us. So that concludes my presentation. Thank you for your interest and attention.